Good evening and welcome to the first session in our spring term money webinar series by the Institute of International Monetary Research in collaboration with the Vincent Center at the University of Buckingham. I'm Dr. Juan Castaneda, Director of the IMR, and today we'll be hosting John Greenwood. Uh, John is Chief Economist uh, of Invesco. He started his career in 1974 as a visiting research fellow at the Bank of Japan. He joined the investment industry later that year as Chief Economist for GT Management, based in Italy in Hong Kong and then in San Francisco. As editor of Asian Monetary Monitor in 1983, he proposed a currency board scheme for stabilizing the Hong Kong dollar that is still in operation today and is indeed the topic of uh, today's uh, webinar. In the 1980s, he was a director of the Hong Kong Futures Exchange Clearing Corporation, a council member of the Hong Kong Stock Exchange, and economic advisor to the Hong Kong government. For his public service to Hong Kong, he was awarded the OBE. In 1998, John joined Invesco and became a member of the Committee on Currency Port Operations of the Hong Kong Monetary Authority. He's also a member of the Shadow Monetary Policy Committee in England and serves on the board of the Hong Kong Association. In October 2020, John was awarded the Silver Bahunia Star by the Hong Kong government for his work in promoting the stability of the Hong Kong dollar. John uh, holds an MA and an honorary PhD from the University of Edinburgh. He's also a fellow of the Institute uh, for Applied Economics, Global Health, and the Study of Business and Enterprise at Johns Hopkins University. On top of it all, may I say that John is a member of the IMR's Academic Advisory Council. John Wingwood will discuss today the Hong Kong monetary system, temporary fix or long-term solution, after which we will allow time for a QA session with viewers at home. Today's presentation will be recorded and made available on our YouTube channel. Questions might be submitted via the tab option and I will moderate them and address the speaker. So John, we're really grateful for your continued support uh, to the Institute over the last uh, few years. And we are very much, uh, we are delighted to host your, your, your webinar. So the floor is entirely yours. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Juan, for that kind introduction. Uh, and I'm very grateful to the Institute uh, and its sponsors for organizing this event. Uh, today, I'm going to speak about one of my favorite topics, uh, that is the Hong Kong monetary system. It's especially interesting because it is a currency board, which most people think of as a very simple type of system but it has some unusual complexities uh, which enable Hong Kong to be a major international financial center. And of course, it's been in operation for nearly 40 years now. What I'm going to do this evening is to run through, first of all, a very brief monetary history, explain how things went wrong in the 1970s and 80s, uh, how things were corrected after 1983 and then steadily improved uh, between 1988 and 2005. And then I want to show you that those reforms have been very effective by discussing the experience of the global financial crisis, uh, the domestic disorders in Hong Kong in 2019 and the recent pandemic. Finally, I will close with some discussion of whether or not Hong Kong has any alternative. So that's the agenda. Briefly then, Hong Kong used to operate on the silver standard. Um, between 1842, when the British took over the island of Hong Kong, and 1935. The reason was that silver was the uh, currency of the region. Um, some countries uh, mined silver and but most of it after a while came from Mexico uh, or from the United States. So there were Mexican or su US silver trade dollars actively uh, in use throughout Asia. And Hong Kong, both Hong Kong and China used silver. The banknotes issued in Hong Kong at that time uh, were issued directly by limited number of chartered banks against silver reserves. 
and the wording on the banknotes was interesting. For example, the Hong Kong Bank, Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank notes would say that the Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank promises to pay the bearer on demand at its office here the sum of $10 or $20, whatever the banknote was, uh, or the equivalent in the currency of the colony, full stop, value received. In other words, we, the bank, have received those silver coins. Uh, we hold silver coins or bullion against the notes that are issued. Now, obviously, in that type of system, the silver price was very important, um, notably because uh, it was fluctuating against the gold price. Um, some of the time it was declining. In fact, most of the 19th century it was declining. And there were times also when it was rising. And in particular, in 1934, um, at the depths of the US depression, or just as uh, after Roosevelt was elected, um, the US made a decision to raise the silver price rather drastically from 25 cents an ounce up to $1.29. And that had the effect of revaluing the Chinese yuan and the Hong Kong dollar upwards very severely. So until then, Hong Kong and China had been relatively exempt from the effects of the Great Depression. But with that big revaluation, it was hopeless. Uh, silver drained out of the countries, they would have had a major uh, contraction and um, even deeper depression. So um, the decision in Hong Kong was made to switch to sterling. Uh, in China, the decision was to switch to a paper standard, but we will not follow that discussion this evening. In terms of balance sheets, this is what Hong Kong looked like under the silver standard. And incidentally, the US would have looked like this. This uh, Japan would have looked like this up to the time of the foundation of the Bank of Japan in 1882. So there was no central bank. There were commercial banks which as assets held gold or silver bullion, in Hong Kong's case, silver bullion and silver trade dollars, against which they issued banknotes. And then below that dashed line, uh, you can see the normal parts of a bank's balance sheet. The public at large, firms and households held deposits as assets. That's obviously liabilities of the banks. And they also held the banknotes issued by the banks and coin, uh, which was issued by the government typically. Uh, and that constituted the money supply. And the banks, instead of clearing through the central bank, uh, operated a, a private clearinghouse to conduct those clearing, clearings. Now, in Hong Kong case, when the decision was taken to adopt the to adopt the sterling standard in place of silver, what happened was this. And you can see that uh, a currency board was introduced. It was called the Exchange Fund and the government took over the silver reserves of the banks, which they had previously held, um, and uh, something would have had to happen. Now, in a normal case, which uh, is this one, the central, sorry, the currency board would have issued those banknotes and coin, and the commercial banks uh, would simply hold a certain amount of vault cash. Uh, but in the Hong Kong case, it was a little bit more complicated. The currency board took over the silver reserves of the banks and issued certificates of indebtedness, explaining that the currency board was indebted to the banks for the silver it had acquired. It sold the silver on world markets and with the proceeds it held or purchased UK government securities. So the banks now held certificates of indebtedness, which they purchased for sterling if they wanted to issue new banknotes. So if you do a consolidation on this set of balance sheets, the certificates of indebtedness uh, cancel out and you can see that the banknotes are now backed by UK government securities. In other respects, things remain the same. So um, Hong Kong now has a 
currency board, uh, but the banknotes are issued by the private banks, provided that they uh, submit sterling to purchase the certificates of indebtedness. That system operated until the early 1970s, but with the uh, decision of President Nixon to uh, close the gold window in August 1971 and the floating of the pound in 1972, things started to change in Hong Kong. First, the Hong Kong dollar was shifted from being fixed to sterling to being fixed to the US dollar. Um, that was a sensible thing to do probably because uh, most of Hong Kong's trade then was with the US and the majority of uh, trade in Asia was financed in US dollars. But the second thing was uh, rather bizarre. The commercial banks were no longer required to pay foreign currency for the right to obtain those certificates of indebtedness uh, with which they would back their banknote issues. And that, in a sense, undermined the, the link between a foreign currency, a foreign anchor currency, and the Hong Kong dollar. Naturally, against that sort of background, the Hong Kong dollar started to move around uh, in the, on the foreign exchange market. The authorities tried to intervene, but they didn't have the mechanisms to do that. And in 1974, they gave up uh, that attempt to peg the currency and the currency was floated in November 1974. So from November 1974 to 1983, there was no convertibility at a fixed rate and no means of controlling the money supply because the exchange fund was not a central bank. In other words, there was no external anchor and equally no internal anchor. Well, in 19, well, that continued for a, a number of years. Um, it was a kind of partially stable equilibrium, but it wasn't really very satisfactory. And in 1982, um, the British government started to negotiate with China over the future of Hong Kong after 1997. And the currency of Hong Kong started to fall rather drastically. Um, the reason, as I said, was because there was no fixing of the, the, the price, that is the exchange rate, and certainly no fixing of the quantity, no, no ability to manage the money supply. In terms of, um, sort of diagrams and uh, so on, in, in academic terms, this was the situation. On the horizontal axis, we have the quantity of money. On the vertical axis, we have the value of money. Notice this is not interest rates, it's one over the price level. <clears throat> So a strong value of the Hong Kong dollar would be higher, a low value would be lower. <clears throat> and essentially what happened was that people decided to hold less Hong Kong dollars. If you like, there was a shift in the demand for Hong Kong dollars. Of course, they were selling their businesses, they were selling shares, they were selling properties, and then they had to, because the Hong Kong dollar was floating, they had to sell the Hong Kong dollar. And despite the fact there was very little growth in the money supply, the Hong Kong dollar started falling very sharply. So this was a shift brought about by a change in um, people's uh, ex expectations about the value of the Hong Kong dollar and the ability to do business in Hong Kong. For those of you who like to think about these things in terms of equations, the Hong Kong system at the time was essentially a two equation system uh, with three unknowns. Now I've put that in a little, little box on the right there. And you can see the price level was a function of the nominal quantity of money and real incomes, the amount of real money that people wanted to hold. The, but the money supply in turn was determined by the exchange rate. But the exchange rate was not determinate, nor was the money supply. So as I say, it was a two equation system with three unknowns. So that meant that the equilibrium point 
could really, the solution could be anywhere in that diagram. I was living in Hong Kong at the time and did a number of analyses of the Hong Kong dollar situation and proposed that the currency board mechanism be restored. And against much skepticism, uh, in October 1983, it was restored. And as you see, since then, the Hong Kong dollar has been basically fixed at 7.8 Hong Kong dollars per US dollar. That system uh, has gone through a number of changes over the years. And I want now to uh, just show you, first of all, how it worked and then some improvements. So first of all, as soon as it was fixed, interest rates between uh, Hong Kong and the US started to converge. So you can see in the top diagram, the three month high bore Hong Kong interbank offered rate and the three month Euro dollar, US dollar rate, um, the, the yellow line and the blue con converging. Although initially in the first phase up to July 19, 1988, there was quite a bit of instability in Hong Kong, in Hong Kong I think because uh, there was not a lot, lot of market credibility. The system was still depending on fixing the price of the banknotes, not on fixing uh, the convertibility of the, the money supply as a whole. It became more stable after 1998 uh, through to the Asian financial crisis, 1997-98, but you can see there was still very considerable instability or lack of credibility. So the interest rate differentials in the lower part of the diagram uh, remained uh, or were at times very large. If we update that to the present, you can see that more recently there's been much less uh, deviation of those interest rates. Uh, I've highlighted the Asian financial crisis and a period when the Chinese Yuan was appreciating and that led to expectations that possibly the Hong Kong dollar would appreciate and therefore Hong Kong dollar interest rates in this diagram or in this chart, the, the black line, uh, Hong Kong dollar interest rates were lower uh, than US dollar interest rates. Another thing that happened under the uh, restored currency board was that the money supply growth rate became relatively more stable. Um, prior to 1983, it had been highly unstable, and that was one of the reasons why I um, started to analyze what was really going wrong with the system. Um, I don't need to dwell on that. I don't think it's um, important at this stage, except to say that um, in the far right hand side, when the Asian crisis began, uh, the Hong Kong dollar money supply started to slow down very abruptly. Another interesting set of results from fixing the exchange rate was that under the fixed exchange rate, uh, Hong Kong and US traded goods prices started to converge. So on the left hand side, we have the Hong Kong dollar being pegged in October 1983. Hong Kong traded goods prices, export unit prices are shown in black and US producer goods prices for finished goods are shown in red. And you can see there's a pretty good relationship between those two most of the time. These are year on year rates of change. However, there's a significant deviation over the Asian, over the period of the Asian financial crisis because other countries in Asia devalued their currencies. And to the extent that Hong Kong was competing with places like Singapore, Taiwan, Korea, it also had to have, well, it wasn't going to devalue the currency, it had to have an internal deflation in order to become competitive again. So that's what explains that deviation on the low side of Hong Kong's prices during and after the Asian financial crisis. It wasn't until about 2004 that Hong Kong had really restored competitiveness. So that's kind of the law of one price as it operated in Hong Kong. But those of you who are familiar with this sort of thing will know that 
non-traded goods do not necessarily converge to the same extent. And you can see here that Hong Kong's consumer prices um, deviated considerably from US consumer prices. In the first phase, um, because at that time Hong Kong was growing much more rapidly than the US and productivity growth was much higher. So uh, domestic services in Hong Kong, rents, uh, restaurant prices, um, the price of a haircut, these kinds of things uh, were able to increase substantially more rapidly uh, than equivalent, the equivalent prices in the US. And then uh, the next circle, the, the right hand, the one in the center is um, that's the episode of the Asian financial crisis, which also affected uh, non-traded goods prices. And then finally, uh, the uh, episode, uh, the third episode, when there's a, a deviation again of Hong Kong prices on the high side, uh, again, because Hong Kong was growing more rapidly uh, than the US over this period and productivity growth was more rapid. That, so those are illustrations of the Balassa Samuelson effect as it applied to Hong Kong. Another interesting result was that um, under the currency board, uh, there were big changes in the structure of the economy, um, principally because uh, China was opening up after 1978. Uh, so in 1980s, as you can see on the left hand side of the chart, uh, roughly 46% of uh, total employment was in manufacturing. But by the end of the 90s, uh, most of that manufacturing had moved across the border into China and services had become the dominant um, industry or the dominant activity of the Hong Kong economy. And this was all able to happen under the currency board. I show you this because some people criticize currency boards because they say currency boards impose unnecessary rigidity on an economy. But here's an example of Hong Kong being able to change its structure very drastically in spite of the fact um, that, that it had the fixed exchange rate. So the fixed exchange rate was no impediment to these structural changes. So I mentioned at the beginning that uh, the system was made more robust between 1988 and 2005. Um, there were basically three reforms. First, um, in 1988 and then in 1996, two changes were made uh, so that the uh, the link between the US dollar and the Hong Kong dollar was no longer just a matter of the banknotes issued, but also the reserve uh, deposits of banks uh, held at the, uh, at the Hong Kong Monetary Authority. Initially, they, held, they did not hold reserves there, but um, the system was revised so that they did hold reserves. And as, as a consequence, um, that meant that the uh, the monetary base was more securely locked to the value of the US dollar, the entire monetary base. In 1998, after the Asian financial crisis, a discounting facility was introduced to enable Hong Kong's um, interest rates to adjust more smoothly. Uh, previously, as I showed you, there had been very severe spikes in Hong, in Hong Kong's interest rates. Um, that was because there was no such sort of smoothing device available. Um, the details of that uh, are that the Hong Kong Monetary Authority issued exchange fund bills and notes. These are liabilities of the central of the monetary authority and um, banks held these and they were able to uh, um, dis obtain discounts from the authority uh, by repoing these bills uh, on an overnight uh, or intraday overnight or even on a term basis. And then the third uh, adjustment was that uh, two convertibility undertakings known in Hong Kong as the CU, CUs, uh, 
were introduced, one on the strong side at 775, one on the weak side at 785. And if we look now at what that did to the balance sheet of the currency board, the top on the right, you can see the clearing balances have been brought onto the balance sheet, so there's no longer a private clearinghouse. Second, uh, the authority is issuing exchange fund bills and notes, which the banks and other institutions can hold, but those can, because they are liabilities of the authority, they can be discounted or exchange with the authority at any time for cash if there is you know, an urgent need for uh, large sales of Hong Kong dollars or something of that kind. So the uh, pressures on the money market and the spikes in interest rates were greatly reduced. This if we now look and see how that was, uh, how that translates into current conditions, uh, you can see that there is uh, in this chart, the Hong Kong dollar, US dollar rate is shown as the black line. There is a spread on either side of it of roughly 1.3% in total uh, between 775 on the strong side and 785 on the weak side. And the if what happens is that the spot rate fluctuates within this band. And if it exceeds the band, then the banks can go to the monetary authority and obtain uh, the Hong Kong dollars on the strong side, because that means there's an inflow. Uh, or if on the, out, on, the, on the weak side, if there's an outflow, they can swap their Hong Kong dollars for US dollars and supply those to their customers. In other words, it's the commercial banks that are taking the initiative here rather than the monetary authority intervening actively to, to fix the rate. That's how the convertibility undertakings operate. And more, more generally, if there is an outflow, um, the banks submit uh, Hong Kong dollars to the authority that reduces the number of Hong Kong dollars into bank market that tightens up the interbank market and that gradually put the pressure on the money supply to reduce. And conversely, if the Hong Kong dollar is on the strong side, funds flow in, that tends to lower, uh, increase the amount of money in, in the interbank market, tends to lower interest rates and um, similarly, conversely with, with the opposite case, it tends to encourage the banks to lend and that leads to faster growth. Uh, of money supply. So that's the way in which the system uh, self adjusts nowadays. And it's capable of handling huge volumes of money. Uh, Hong Kong is a major uh, international financial center and it is able to adjust to this environment uh, very effectively. Um, one question which may be in your mind, and that is, how does the Hong Kong money supply nowadays behave relative to the US money supply? <clears throat> and the answer is here, um, if we just focus on the, the, the right hand part of the uh, chart from roughly from 2010 onwards, uh, the dark blue line is US money growth. They can use M2 in this case. And the red line is Hong Kong dollar M3. Um, and you can see that the Hong Kong money supply tends to fluctuate in terms of its growth rate around the US money growth rate. Um, obviously, they, they don't need to be identical because Hong Kong's growth rate is different. The demand of its people to hold Hong Kong dollars differs from the demand for US people to hold US dollars and so on. Um, but by and large, that's what happens. Um, but when there's a problem in Hong Kong, um, the rate or rate of growth will, will tend to deviate. And over on the far right hand side, um, the slowdown in 2019 2020 of Hong Kong money growth was associated with the um, 
and riots that occurred in Hong Kong uh, following the legislation by um, Hong Kong government under the uh, persuasion or instructions of the, the, the mainland uh, to change the extradition laws and, and then to change the voting system. So um, there's still a high degree of flexibility, uh, but it isn't just the movement of the currency. I want to emphasize that the adjustment mechanism spreads really uh, much more broadly. So how did the Hong Kong economy behave in these recent crises? In the, in the global financial crisis, you can see um, the monetary base uh, increased hugely uh, from 2008 through 2009 to 2011. Um, just like the monetary base in the United States. The Hong Kong, the Hong Kong dollar was regarded as a safe haven, just like the dollar was regarded as a safe haven. Pro property prices in Hong Kong fell by 20 to 25% in 2009. But um, there were absolutely no bank failures and no major financial failures in Hong Kong. That was due to something I haven't yet mentioned, and that is the macro prudential regime that the Hong Kong Monetary Authority operates. Basically, the philosophy is to keep um, leverage at a minimum, uh, or at least to not to allow it to become excessive. So for mortgages, there is a 70% uh, maximum loan to value ratio, and banks are required to observe maximum 50% um, debt service ratio for individuals borrowing money. So they need to check their income, their wealth and so on, their out outgoings in order to ensure that, uh, households don't become over leveraged. And that uh, system started in the 1990s. Hong Kong was one of the early economies to adopt macro prudential um, controls or mechan supervisory mechanisms for the banks, uh, and that has continued to this day. And there's various um, uh, refinements, variations in those uh, ratios which have been applied in recent years. Uh, second, with respect to the street demos and riots in 2019-20, um, the Hong Kong dollar had been near the weak side, that is 785, um, the weak side uh, exchange rate um, during 2019. Um, and some people attributed that to the early part of the, the demonstrations. Uh, but you can see it was at that level well before then. Um, but then uh, as though the rioting and the demonstrations continued, and Hong Kong's economic growth was very severely disrupted. Nevertheless, the currency moved from the weak side to the strong side up to 775. <clears throat> the reason for that is that um, there were a lot of um, Chinese companies listed in New York, uh, which were uh, either um, expelled from the New York Stock Exchange or because of the um, the relations between the Trump White House and the and Beijing um, were discouraged from listing in the US and most of those companies relisted in Hong Kong so there were big inflows into Hong Kong during that period uh, in addition as I just mentioned the money growth in Hong Kong slowed rather drastically, and that alone would have tightened financial conditions in Hong Kong and tended to push the uh, exchange rate to the strong side. So despite all of those demonstrations, and all of that uh, discontent in Hong Kong, bottom line is that there were no net outflows uh, during the period. Then finally, uh, with the pandemic, uh, the currency has remained fairly buoyant. Um, you can see in this chart, which shows the GDP growth rates for Hong Kong and for uh, the US, 
that Hong Kong's GDP slowed very significantly ahead of uh, the US slowdown. That's the effect of the 2019 disruptions and then slowed to roughly the same amount or by roughly the same amount on a year on year basis uh, as the US at the start of the pandemic. Um, and I um, obviously can't take you through to what will happen in the future. What I want to close with is a very brief discussion of the, the currency system for the future. From what I've said, uh, you can uh, gather that um, it's my view that the fixing of the Hong Kong dollar is the right system for Hong Kong. Obviously, uh, theoretically, the currency could float now. The Hong Kong Monetary Authority has all the mechanisms it needs to manage the money supply if it chose to do so. Um, but as we've seen in past episodes, when the Hong Kong dollar is allowed to float, um, the movements can be very, very drastic, given the very large size of capital flows relative to Hong Kong. And of course, with um, political events in China or in the US or, or tensions between those two, uh, you can imagine that the, the floating currency would be um, uh, very, very volatile. Another question which is often raised is, would it be appropriate to shift the US dollar fix uh, to another anchor currency, um, either the yuan, euro, yen, or silver? Well, I think we can eliminate uh, the euro, the yen, the Japanese yen, and the British pound for various political, historical, uh, or economic reasons. Um, Hong Kong's two major trading partners are the US and China. And so it makes sense to think to one of those two. The problem with the yuan is that although there is some convertibility on current account transactions, uh, there are still capital controls. And the Hong Kong system depends very much on the arbitrage between interest rates in Hong Kong and the interest rates in the anchored country currency, um, currently the US dollar. But, um, I dare say that would be feasible even now with the yuan, uh, but uh, for the moment there's no decision to, to shift to a yuan peg. Another option which is sometimes discussed is would it be a good idea to fix to a basket or a trade weighted index of currencies? My personal view is that, that really doesn't gain um, anything. Now, there's no real benefit to doing that. Um, currently, there is a, an interest rate in Hong Kong, there's an interest rate in the US, and it's very clear which one is more advantageous. And depending on which one is lower, people will borrow at the lower one and invest uh, in the higher one, the, the one whose interest rates are higher. That tends to close that gap. So uh, that's an arbitrage mechanism which would become a little bit more complicated under a trade weighted index. In addition, those countries that do operate trade weighted indices like Singapore um, or indeed like China itself, allegedly, um, in reality, there's a high degree of discretion in that kind of system and every now and then the trade weighted basket has to be amended and so on. So it's not really clear that that is a, a, a mechanical system. It's, it's much more of a discretionary system. My view is that the currency board um, is an automatic, non-discretionary and self-correcting system. And the advantage of the US dollar for Hong Kong is that it greatly enhances Hong Kong's role as an international financial center in Asia because it means that securities, um, IPOs, new listings, these kinds of things, um, um, syndicated loans, all these kinds of things can be priced using the US dollar, effectively the US um, markets, they're priced on a New York basis, but in Asia using the Hong Kong dollar, which is effectively a clone uh, of the US dollar. So my conclusion is that Hong Kong's currency board is not just a temporary fix, 
as I said, it's been in place already nearly 40 years, um, but I don't see why it shouldn't continue perhaps for another 40 years. To conclude, um, I think that uh, in an academic sense, just like David Hume's species flow mechanism uh, under the gold standard was self-correcting, Hong Kong's currency board is self-correcting. It en enables that automatic adjustment mechanism to occur. It enables the price level of Hong Kong to adjust in such a way that um, the Hong Kong dollar, US dollar fix uh, remains there, but the economy, the monetary system adjusts to the exchange rate rather than the other way around. Thank you.